Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you on this Lord's Day. It's good to be in God's house together to be able to worship our Lord. This morning, we will be taking a look at the last two verses in the book of Jude. After, I believe, it's been 10 weeks of studying the book of Jude, we come to these last two verses, and we see that the author of Jude has come full circle, and now he gives us very encouraging words of how we can live in a world that is so tumultuous, in a world that is so anti-Christ, against Christ. And it's good to be able to look at these words and find our hope there, rest our hope in the realities of Jesus Christ. I trust you had a good week. If not, I, I'm sorry, but I do hope that this time here together will bring you back to a sense of, yes, it is well, it is well with my soul and that you will find your rest and peace as you worship the Lord together. If you did have a good week, well then great. I hope today simply adds to the goodness of God's blessing to you. Now, there's an old hymn that says, showers of blessings. And who here doesn't want showers of blessings? Right? We don't want just those raindrops of blessings, we want showers. And that's what the hymn says. And we look forward to God's blessing. And how does God bless us? Well, God bless us when we go to the places where he extends his blessings. Just like if you want to get wet in the rain, you don't stay inside. You go outside and get wet, correct? Well, so with God's blessings, if you want to be blessed by God, you move to the place where God is blessing. And one of those areas is the house of God, where God's people join together to worship him. And there... We are exposed to his grace. There we are exposed to his blessings. Let's stand together. Let's sing in your red hymnal number 117. We come, O Christ, to you. Thank you to Gigi, who is covering for Rick and Chrisanne. It is good to be able to worship together. Number 117, we come, O Christ, to you, and Gigi will lead us. Let's stand together.
Let's pray. Lord our God, we are grateful that we can come to you. We are grateful that you have opened our eyes, that we would recognize that you exist. And you've opened our hearts that we would receive you. And now, Lord, you allow us to even open our mouths that we would worship you. We thank you, Lord, that we have come to you because you have first come to us. And we worship you this morning. May you be glorified. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. This morning's reading will be from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, beginning in verse 24. The words of Christ. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has sent, has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, My testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has has himself bore witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you did not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Now can you, how can you believe when you receive glory from another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me, But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Just want to repeat verse 24 as I scroll to it. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Amen. Please open in your copy of the scriptures to that epistle next to the last book in the Bible, the epistle of Jude. Once again, I'll remind you, it's a letter written by the brother of James, the 
half-brother of Jesus Christ. You will recall that Jude takes us <clears throat> with, with very promising words at the very beginning into a world uh, that occurred in the early church that's not pretty. Uh, it's amazing to see how false teachers made their way into the church so early on and began to pervert the word of God. They began to twist it and literally pervert it. And we looked at what Jude has to say about these teachings and about these individuals. We should take these words to heart. We should also, as a result, develop a compassion for those who sit outside of Christ. Our tendency, especially in our divided America, is to hate them. They're the opposition. They are the enemies. And yes, they are in terms of uh, of practically speaking, the opposition, the, uh, they oppose Christ and they are the enemy. But listen, they are not your enemy. They are God's enemy. And so Jude makes it very clear that we are to be patient with them. We are to snatch them out of the fire. And that requires love. That requires compassion. It requires mercy. And Jude makes it clear that in the process, be careful that you do not be contaminated by their sin. Why does he say that? Because it is very likely for us to do just that, because like them, we like sin. Like them, we enjoy what we ought not to. There's a particular corruption that resides in us that just lures us to sin. And it makes us very comfortable there even. Well, my friends, let's keep in mind our attitude towards a world that stands in opposition to Christ. Remember this, you were once there as well, right? And aren't you glad that somebody loved you enough to share the gospel with you? That someone cared enough, whether they came and knocked on your door, or you heard it on the radio, or, or maybe you read it, whatever the case, somebody presented the gospel to you. Maybe you came to church and heard the gospel. Whatever the case, somebody presented the gospel to you. And for that, we should be very thankful, recalling that we, not too long ago, were, were in opposition to Christ as well. Well, as we come to the very end, verses 24 and 25, we looked at the first half of verse 24 last week, but we'll look at the second half today and then conclude with verse 25. Let me read this doxology to you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And we saw that the beginning of this doxology here, verse 24, tells us that God is able to keep us from stumbling. That's good news. Isn't, we could certainly appreciate that. When Jude tells us that God keeps us from stumbling, he's not talking about God keeping us uh, from stumbling over a cracked sidewalk as we make our way through town. And neither is he saying that you are, through God, able to do things you would never be able to do otherwise, that you are able to hike, climb, and run, and just do it. No, that's not what Jude is getting at here. Jude is saying that through God, we are able to live a life that is not morally stumbling. That God is able to keep us from error. Because of Christ on our side, we do not have to limp through life. He's able to do that for us. It doesn't mean he will it means he is able. What we saw last week is how he is able and how it is that he will keep us from stumbling. And we said that it is by us abiding in him. When we abide in Christ, he keeps us from stumbling. When we, well, take a look at 1 John 2, 6. When we apply 1 John 2, 6, he keeps us from stumbling. 
And let me remind you what 1 John 2, 6 says. Whoever says that he abides in him, in Christ, whoever says that he abides in Christ ought to walk in the way in which Christ walked. So the Christian life is not simply imitating Christ, what would Jesus do, but rather it is taking on the principles of Christ, taking on the truths of Christ, and making them my own. Thus I am abiding in Christ. With that comes a heart passion for Jesus as well. So it's not just a matter of doing the right things, but rather coming from the heart, a passion for Jesus Christ, a love, a devotion. My friends, anybody could be religious. We're not talking here about being religious. We're talking about loving your Savior. We're talking about devoting yourself to the one who provides a means by which your life can be navigated. With the goal, of course, of knowing God and being blessed by him. Everybody wants his blessing. I know I do. In fact, you would be foolish not to. He is the God of blessing. He is a good, good father. However, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is not God blessing me. Rather, what we see here in these two verses is that the ultimate goal is a doxological achievement in which we make our lives all about the one who saves us, about God himself. You'll recall the distinction between a benediction and a doxology. What we have here is a doxology. The benediction, it's God blessing me. God, Lord, bless me. The doxology is, Lord, I want to bless you. I want to glorify you. And that's what we have in these two verses, a doxology that says, to him who is able. Notice here, it does not say, to him who is able to make us able. It does not say, for us, because God is able. It says, to him God, who is able to keep us from stumbling. Now, what you'll notice here, if you read closely, is that there are three characteristics in these two verses that needs to be incorporated into the Christian life, into the Christian psyche. Three ways of thinking, if you will, that ought to carry us from day to day. In fact, if you apply these three principles it will not only carry you from day to day, it will take you from month to month, year to year, all through your life with deep and growing hope. We all want hope. A deeper and growing hope. If you apply these three principles this morning, I'm making a big promise here, but it comes directly from the text. These three traits will undergird your hope these three traits will bring pleasure to you as you live as a Christian. And it will develop in us a lion-hearted hope, a gritty, persevering, realistic, resolute, never diminishing hope. Let's take a look at what they are. Here's the first one. Blameless. Blameless. Why does God provide the means to keep us from stumbling? Well, look at the text. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless. Why does God want you to keep from stumbling? So that you will be blameless. It's not so you won't scratch your knees. It's so that you will become blameless. That is, innocent, guiltless, untarnished by this world. It's a big promise. Blameless, pure. Now notice how important purity is. Here we're told that the Christian is going to be presented to God himself. Can you imagine that? You, Christian, are going to stand one day before God. 
There will be millions and millions of people behind you, but that will be of no matter to you whatsoever. It will be you and God alone. We don't know what that, that day is going to be. Some of us anticipate it's going to be sooner than later, but we do not know. But it will be. And God says, I want you to be presented to me blameless. And that's why I provide a way by which you could keep from stumbling. And by the way, if you read through the scriptures, this text here doesn't say it, but if you read through the scriptures, you will not only be with other people, you will be before God in the presence of throngs of angels. I find that so interesting. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 tells us that angels long to look into these things. And you'll recall, I've told you this before, that idea of longing to look at these things, it's almost as if the, the, the author is drawing a picture of angels looking over the balcony and stretching their necks to see, hey, what's going on down there when it comes to salvation? Angels love to peer on this to see what God is doing in our lives, in the lives of the church. And in fact, one writer notes that angels are spectators of God's great joy. Ever since creation, he notes, they've been watching and marveling. And he notes from Job 38 that God laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and, quote, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. The angels shouted for joy. And there you will stand before God in his trinity and before a th multitude of angels and with all of creation behind you. But the greatest thing will be that you will be standing in the glory of God. You will be consumed by the glory of God. You see why he wants you to be blameless? He doesn't want your shame to dirty his glory. That's the glory that Isaiah witnessed that's recorded for us in chapter 6 of that book. You'll recall the angels surrounding God and crying out, glory, glory, glory. And I like to think that's glory, Father, glory, Son, and glory to the Holy Spirit. And, and there it describes his his, his robe as covering the earth that's his majesty his authority his glory just encompassing all of creation and so God wants us to stand before him without any blemish blameless that's what the sacrificial lamb was to be recall that in the old testament a blameless or a sacrificial lamb without any blemish whatsoever. And by the way, husbands, the Bible calls on you to present your wives as being blameless before God without blemish or wrinkle. Now the wrinkle part is hard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let me take those words back. Without blemish, without wrinkle. Husbands, that is your duty. That is our task as spiritual leaders in a home. Ephesians 5.25, if you want to go home and read it. But what we see in the scriptures, what we see when we look in the mirror, is that we are not blameless. We are blameworthy. Psalm 15 makes that point very clearly. We are not without blemish. And so what does God do? He provides for us the means by which our lifestyle, our choices, uh, our character becomes increasingly less blemished. We call that sanctification. Uh, we become from morally imperfect to more, more morally perfected. Less tarnished instead of discolored. He sanctifies us. And, and, so, and so doing, God is keeping us from being contaminated by this world. It is so difficult not to be contaminated by this world. 
We have to live in it. And it's so hard not to be exposed to the filth and to be attracted by the filth of this world. He wants us to be properly presented before him. Therefore, he guards us, he protects us, he keeps us from stumbling. Well, I can say this, that one of the great challenges of living the Christian life is that for many people, the Christian life is far too restrictive. In fact, if you're young, you probably feel like saying amen right now. The older you get, the less you would amen that. The world when you're young is far more attractive than when you're older. One of the complaints people have about Christianity is that it is far too restrictive. And, and of course, we all want the safety of restrictions. Uh, a few years ago, we were at uh, uh, the Grand Canyon, and, and my wife and I were constantly saying, shouldn't there be railings here? And there weren't, right? We, we, want, we want the safety, but boy, are those restrictions ugly. Nobody wants a fence around the Grand Canyon. <laughs> but those restrictions do help, don't they? We do want the safety. And that's why we tell our children not to stick a fork in the outlet. But we prize the safety. We don't necessarily like the restriction. We, we want freedom. We do love our freedom, don't we? Just a few years ago, we were in Tennessee, and, and oddly enough, we were driving, and, and the windows were down, and, and on the radio was playing what I believe was a Broadway song on freedom, and the song was just blaring, you know? Very patriotic song about freedom. And next to us comes this truck filled with caged turkeys. <laughs> it was just feathers everywhere. And these turkeys poking their heads out, looking at us like saying, really, freedom? Do you know where we're going? We actually caught it on video. The problem is that we, under, we misunderstand what freedom is. We have a, an unclear understanding of what freedom really is. Freedom in life is having the appropriate restrictions. Freedom is not no restrictions. Freedom is the appropriate restrictions. And I like what uh, Pastor Tim Keller, how he il illustrates this reality. He, he speaks about fish. And he notes that a fish is free to swim in water. And he says, only in water is the fish free to realize its full potential. If it comes out of the water, it's no longer free. A fish cannot realize its potential without the restriction of water. It needs the water. It needs to be restricted by water. And so it is with humans. We cannot realize our potential. We cannot actually be free without the restrictions that God gives us through his moral standards. Remove those moral standards and we shrivel up. Why? Because we are created in the image of God. He notes, True freedom is not the absence of restriction. Freedom is finding and complying to the right restrictions, the ones that fit the particulars of your nature and your being. What is your nature? What is your being? You were created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. And God is a moral being. And because you are created in his image, you have that restriction, morality, his standards. Remove those standards and you will shrivel up. Your soul will shrivel up. You will find it very difficult to, lo to live. You will not want to live. God's restrictions will actually bring you freedom. And my friends, those restrictions will bolster your hope. When you begin to live within the restrictions that God has created for you, you'll, dis you'll discover that hope begins to bubble in you. A and your hope begins to actually 
actually outdo your doubt. Your hope will actually move you and stir you. Your hope will carry you. But you have to live within the confines of God's moral restrictions. You have to be blameless. That is to say, the more blameless you are, the more you're looking to live correctly before God, the more you will be filled with hope. I'm not speaking about legalistically. I'm talking about a heart devotion, not just saying, well, I'll do the right thing because, well, I, I want hope. No. I'm talking about a passion, a devotion that comes from your heart to God that says, Lord, I just want to please you because you are my Lord. I, I love my Lord and I want to please my Lord and so I will look to live a blameless life knowing that I will fail but God in his grace forgives me and God in his grace sanctifies me. God in his grace gives me the means by which I do not have to stumble. And in doing so, I discover that my hope is abounding more and more so. Undeterred hope is not only the result of seeking to live a blameless life, but here's number two. Hope is augmented when you know God's joy. So first we have blameless. Now we have being joy-filled. Still there, verse 24. Nothing will ever bring you greater joy than the God-given ability to stand before him blameless. That's what we see there, that you would stand before him blameless and with great joy. Not just joy, but great joy. Can you imagine it? Begin to imagine it now because one day it will happen. In fact, begin to long for it. I'm not saying don't enjoy this life. Just understand you're passing through. It gets better for those who are in Christ. Joy came to us through Jesus Christ, and now joy is going to be multiplied as we live for Christ, and it will be finalized when we are with Christ in eternity. Our joy will be ever more abounding as we employ Christ in us. And it will culminate when we stand before him on that day in eternity. I know we strive to live, don't we? We do everything we can to live, to live well. And that's only natural. It's a good thing. But please, my friends, understand that this is not the whole of it. That for the Christian, it gets not only better, it becomes great. With great joy to those who pursue Christ in this life. Great joy. Joy did come to us. We shouldn't forget that joy. We need to long for that joy. A joy that surpasses even our understanding. We cannot begin to understand the depth of the joy that we're going to have when we stand before the Lord blameless in his love. Joy came to us and now our actions actually need to match our title. What is our title? We are the people of God's joy. And so now our lives need to match that title, we are to go to Christ for the fulfillment of that joy. It's not going to happen by the world's influence on us. It will only happen through Christ's word, Christ's influence on you. And you'll develop joy. Now, I've met those people who are real joy suckers. I sometimes see them coming, and I know they're going to take out that vacuum and put it right here in my heart, and they're going to suck every ounce of joy I had that day. Don't be that person. Please don't be that person. People will avoid you if you're that person. And God is dishonored if you are that person. Live according to the title that God has laid on you. You are my child. I am the God of joy. And you should live in that joy. Understanding that that joy will be culminated only in eternity. And that joy, my friends, is going, to, is going to reinforce and sustain your hope. This is why the Israelites actually sang 
um, psalms of ascent, these joyous songs as they pilgrimed uh, up to Jerusalem. They, they would sing these songs, we call them the psalms of ascent, to remind them of who God is and who they're going to worship so as to start to stimulate their joy as they approach the temple. Because like us, they would forget that there's reason for joy. And so they had to go back to the scriptures and remind themselves through song about the joy that is with them, in them, through God. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And then the following verses explain why and all the reasons for our joy. Make a joyful noise. Now, here's a word in contrast. That joy that you have in Christ is going to be compromised by the degree of blame or shame residing in your life. In other words, the further you move from Christ, the less joy you're going to have. The more you indulge in this world, the less joy you will be able to experience. And by the way, on that day when you are standing before God, and, and, and you lived as you wanted to, you just ignored God's word, you're not going to go from less joy to, from more joy to neutral. It's not going to be a neutral state. I remember some years ago, uh, I took this young man, a teenager, 15, 16 year old uh, boy, who had no father image in his life, and he got himself in all kinds of trouble, and it was obvious to his mother that this boy was on his way to become a criminal. And so she handed him over to me, eventually he became a ward of the state. She handed him over to me and said, what can you do for him, Pastor? And I tried my utmost, but I saw nothing was really working. He was going from bad to worse to really bad. And so I said, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take him to a prison. And he's gonna get scared straight. And so I made an appointment with the county jail uh, where Ed used to work at the time, but I did not see him there. I made an appointment, and, um, and off we went, and this young man got a tour of the juvenile detention center. It was a very nice lady, and I was hoping for a really mean, angry man. <laughs> Scare him straight. It's a very nice lady, very nice lady. I said, mm, oh well. And after 45 minutes of me sitting there waiting, the two of them came out, and she points to him and says, and remember, no posters on a wall if you're here. I'm like, posters on a wall? I can live without posters on a wall, if that's the worst of it. And when she left, I said, so what was it like? He said, it's like a bad day at summer camp. I said, you, you're not scared straight. He goes, no, it was a bad day at summer camp. I could do this. My friends, when you stand before God, and you lived as you pleased, you are not going to turn to God and say, well, this was like a bad day at summer camp. There is going to be a particular dread in you, a fear because of your sin against God. You will be judged, not unto condemnation. That's what we just read in John chapter 5. But there will be judgment of the Christian for how you lived your life. Recall once again Isaiah chapter 6. When he saw the glory of God, how did he respond? Did he say, oh, this is great, I love it, show me more? No, what did he say? Do you recall? Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe meaning what distress what horror, what great sorrow is on me right now. He says, woe is me. And, and, and he explains, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. In other words, I'm a sinner amongst, uh, of sinners. And he says, not only am I a sinner of sinners, I dwell in the midst of the people of, of, of unclean lips. In other words, I, I am a sinner. I, I live with sinners. I am unworthy of standing here in God's great glory. And he melted. 
And God has to come and soothe him and forgive him and prepare him for the work that God would have him do here on earth. Some people would say, well, it's the Old Testament. Well, take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10 reads this way. For we must all appear, referring to Christians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body. That is, in other words, judged, you'll be judged for how you lived your life here on this earth, whether good or evil. The word there, evil, in the English is rather strong. In the Greek, the word is follows. It means worthless or bad. You will be judged for how you lived here on this world, whether good or worthless. Now, many of us will say, well, I'm not an evil person, but is your life worthless for Christ? You will be judged accordingly. Yes, you will enter heaven. Why? Because of the covenant Christ has made through his blood for you. But understand the dread that will be in you as you stand before God in his judgment, sometimes referred to as the Bema Seat judgment of God. Now, in contrast, as I was studying this week, the, a particular verse kept popping up. I finally said, well, let me look up Zephaniah 317. Why does it keep coming up? Why has so many commentators made mention of it? Well, let me read to you from the Old Testament book of Zephaniah 317. It reads this way. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You see there the love of God that produces a particular joy in God over you. God's joy over his church. God's joy over his people. Charles Spurgeon notes that the Christian life is about having that same joy in us. That we should have God's joy towards us. We should have joy for God in us. That joy-filled life will strengthen your hope. As you multiply joy in Christ, in your own heart, you will see that your hope will also be multiplied. And I assure you, life will be much better no matter who's elected president, no matter how many bills you have, and no matter what may happen in your family. God's hope will thrive and carry you because of joy. Joy. Well, there's a third one here, verse 25. A third characteristic in the Christian, for the Christian, if indeed you want to see your hope increase and even abound. We saw number one, blameless. Two, to be joy-filled. Here's number three, convinced. Convinced. You need to be convinced. The more convinced you are, the more joy, rather, the more hope you will have. Verse 24 says that you will stand in the presence with great joy. You need to be convinced that that's going to happen. But look at verse 25. It says, to the only God. My friends, realize that there, there's really no such thing as gods. Small g-o-d-s. It doesn't exist. Those are myths. Those are social constructs, counterfeits. Here we see the nature of God, the only God. His nature is monotheistic. Mono meaning one, theistic meaning God. There is but one God. And there is but one God we will answer to. There is but one God who will rescue you. Therefore, there ought to be but one God that we will live for. Just one. Just one. You see here his immensity. 
how great, how big, how majestic is our God. The eternal, uncreated creator and sustainer stands alone. He is the cause of all that exists. He is the uncaused cause. And you must be convinced that he is God and stands alone as the only God if you want to see your hope abound. Take a look at the next phrase. So the only God, our Savior, our Savior. In this simple title, we understand God's actions towards us. He is the one that rescues us. He's our Savior. He's the one that intervenes when we are at our worst. And here, my friends, you see his heart toward you. Savior. You must be convinced. You must be convinced that he is your Savior. Not the Savior, but your personal Savior. You must be convinced if you want to see your hope increase. If you're not convinced of this, your hope will diminish. It will falter. You must be convinced that he is your Savior. And then Jude writes, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here we have the means by which he saves us. He does not save us just by anyone, not just any emissary, but rather specifically and only through Jesus Christ, who is there, it says, Lord, meaning God, the ruler who saves us. And here we see his sacrifice, that God the Son will lay down his life willingly for us, that he would leave his place in glory, to become a man and to die this torturous, humiliating death as a criminal in order to pay the price for your sins. You must be convinced of that. You must be convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life if you want your hope to surface. Convinced. And then Jude writes, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority. You see here his place in creation. His place in creation. He's not just another being, but rather he is what we see here, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all. He writes here glory, meaning his moral splendor. Uh, that is to say that God is without blemish whatsoever. There's no stain. There, there, there's no moral wrinkle. Glory and then majesty, referring to the transcending greatness, a greatness that surpasses anyone or anything we can imagine. And dominion, his undiluted power and his authority, his sovereign freedom, his freedom of action to do as he pleases. Friends, you must be convinced of the overwhelming greatness of God if you want hope, your hope, to survive. If you don't see God this way, your hope will dwindle and you will begin to despair. And then Jude writes, Before all time and now and forever, amen. God has always been before all time, he writes. And God will always continue to be, now and forever. God suffers no change whatsoever. We read so in James chapter 117. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He doesn't change. And here we see his timelessness. And you must be convinced of the timelessness of God who never changes if you want your hope to be secure. A fickle God like Allah, for example, you cannot place your hope in. 
But the God of the Bible is one that doesn't change. And there is your anchor for your hope, a changeless God. Ground your hope in his ability to do as he says, salvation, his truth, his kingdom, all this will succeed. Why? Because he said so, and he does not change. Because God is able to accomplish whatever it is that he wills. And so we place our hope there. You must be convinced that God is the only God, that he is your Savior through Jesus Christ. You must be convinced that Christ is Lord of your life if you want to see your hope abound. You must be convinced of God's overwhelming greatness and worthy of your devotion, and you must be convinced that God will never change if indeed you want to see hope in your heart. The world does all it can. It does its utmost to take away your hope. And they will succeed. It will succeed. Unless, of course, these truths, these three truths, are residing in you deeply and taking root. You live by them. Now, Charles Simeon asked the question, can you agree to this statement and say amen, as Jude just did? as angels do right now? Seek to live, he writes. Seek to live in this spirit every day and all day long, and when you face that last day, you will change where you live, but not what you do. And you will change your sorrow, but not your song. Keep in mind, that the little daily deaths to ourselves, when we say no to ourselves, when the world is so attractive, when sin is so luring, and we say no, we are, are, are dying these little deaths to ourselves. But the more you have these little deaths to yourself, the more you increasingly become like Christ. 1 John 1, or 2.26. And yes, saying no to myself feels like a death at that very point. But it produces a potent, lasting hope in your heart, which vanishes away despair. And that hope not only takes away despair, look, it also takes away resentment. And hope also takes away fear. In fact, hope can even erase bad memories we all need more hope and here we have a prescription for how to increase our hope in Christ contend for the faith my friends and contending for the faith begins with contending with yourself contend with yourself our Lord and Savior we are grateful for this simple and yet deep epistle you give to us through your half-brother. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that is listed here for us and for showing to us how we can increase in our hope that you've given, that you've bestowed us with. May you be praised as we place our hope in you. Amen.
people of God, live in the power of Christ. May you stand there. May you walk there. May you sleep in his power and rise up in his power. And may he be glorified by your life until you see him face to face. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.